if there's a life hanging in the balance, we're willing to put our lives on the line so that other person may live. My dad and I were actually really close. I was definitely a daddy's girl. I felt like we were always having these adventures out in the wild. They say your life can be turned upside down in a blink of an eye. Life was awesome until something unexpected happened. All of a sudden, out of absolutely nowhere, I just got this crazy feeling. I didn't know exactly what had happened, but I knew that it was my dad. And I just shook my head and I said, no, <laughs> no. An unexpected tragedy comes. A romance breaks up. A terrible injustice is done. And you feel so alienated and so lost. But you can start life all over again with a clean slate. We had a family reunion this summer and all of our grandchildren came home. And oh, it was one of the most wonderful, wildest times I ever saw. And when I'd get tired, I'd say, oh, I've got to go back and study a few minutes. And I'd go back and lie down a few minutes and then come back for some more. But you know, I love those children. It was great. I've had this home for many years. And I've had a wonderful family that God has given me and my wife. And as I think back over the years, I'm in a state of thankfulness. Now God wants you to live. He wants you to live life to the fullest and he has a plan for you that will prosper you and bless you. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and might have it to the fullness. He wants you to have life. He wants you to enjoy life, to give you the assurance that your sin is forgiven, that you're going to heaven when you die. Facing death, things become a lot clearer. I was on top of the world. I had everything going for me. I had just been promoted to drive the hook and ladder truck. Felt like I was Superman. It was July 24th, 2007, a day that changed my life forever. The unit's responding to the structure fire report, single story commercial fire through the roof. My job as a driver of the hook and ladder truck is to get on the roof and ventilate it, open it up with a chainsaw so that the companies coming inside, the fire can actually make their way there without all the smoke and heat upon them. We arrived on scene. I put our aerial to the roof, brought my chainsaw in hand. When I got on top of the roof, I saw fire out of the rear of the building come out of the skylight. And I stepped over a division wall. up on the ground and when I looked around all I could see was orange fire all around me I came to the realization that this was it I was gonna die in life there are things that you will never anticipate 
things that completely ruin the plan that you have for your life. Things that you never, ever imagine. My dad was a very big outdoorsman. We were always camping and fishing and hunting and you name it. If it's outside, we were always out doing it. When I was in college, I really didn't see my dad that often. So we decided to actually go down to Lake Powell. We just spent the entire week um, houseboating and water skiing and wakeboarding, and we just had such an amazing time. A week after that trip ended, out of absolutely nowhere, I just got this crazy feeling. Basically, I just wanted to go home, and I didn't know why. So we went, we get out of the car, it was my aunt, <laughs> and um, just the, the look in her eyes, and it was just such a deep sorrow. And I just shook my head, and I said, no, <laughs> no, no. My dad had been murdered. You're just overcome with anger and sadness and grief to a degree that you never knew before. As people were coming down the line at the funeral, telling me all of these things that, you know, your dad is in a better place, I just couldn't believe it. And I couldn't believe in heaven because it just seemed like such a fairy tale to me. It was something that you tell somebody to make them feel better. Now we want to soften the reality of death. We don't want to talk about it. Some of us don't want to think about it. So we have a lot of cosmetics and facelifts and the frantic search for the mythical fountain of youth that goes on. But I don't want to turn tonight to the psychologist or the sociologist or the medical students, but to the Bible. What does the Bible say about death? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.2, there's a time to be born and a time to die. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. Death ushers in so much uncertainty, and we ask ourselves, why, why, why? And I want to quote one passage from Amos, the fourth chapter, that says, prepare to meet thy God. And I want to ask you tonight, are you prepared? to die. When my dad died, it really did change death in my eyes because people were telling me that he's in a better place, but I couldn't believe that. But I was really hoping to be able to see my dad again to just have something, anything. I was just desperate for that. I desperately wanted my dad to come. When I thought about the man who murdered my dad, I, I honestly hated him. And when I saw his picture in the newspaper with any of the newspaper coverage, I literally shuddered. He was kind of like the villain in my mind. He wasn't even really human. And I never thought that I'd be able to forgive him. It had been about nine years since my dad's murder. And I think it all just kind of came to a head and I kind of just fell apart. I became very depressed and I fell into a, a pretty deep, dark hole. My greatest fear at that time was that there was gonna be something wrong with me and I would die and I would leave my children. I had some family members come up to me and say, Lori, I think it's time to try some medication. And I remember just crying and saying, is it that obvious that I'm really not doing well? You can imagine hell on earth. This was it. There's a firefighter through the roof and it's very 
the burn started. You can imagine the first layer of your skin burning off, the second layer, the third layer, and down to your tendons. I came to the realization that this was it. I was going to die. And all I could see was my life flash before my eyes, like a DVD on rewind. So as a young man in high school, I wasn't exposed to, to drinking and partying. And I took it to the next level and was doing it quite often. And I went to college, it was all about getting girls. Me and all my buddies. Partying, I lived for myself, for my indulgences. I would often wake up next to a woman that I hardly recognized. I remember her name. My dad tried to talk to me a couple times about God. I'd just blow him off. Not for me, not now. Don't need it. I'm in control of my life. The scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And if we're sinners, then we are doomed. By that I mean Jesus used the word hell, and that's the future of all of us if we don't put our trust in Jesus Christ. People do not want to be warned of judgment in hell. A lady said some time ago, I hate the very thought of hell. So do I. And I also hate the sin that sends them there. I hate war. I hate the fact that people are starving in the world, but my hating it does not change the facts. Is it right for me to warn you tonight what Jesus taught and what the Bible teaches from cover to cover? Well, suppose you were a drowning man and I have the gospel lifeboat and I'm not going to let you drown if I can help it. Now, what is the nature of hell? Essentially and basically, it is separation from God. It's the banishment from the presence of all that is joyous and good and righteous and happy. Matthew 8, 12, hell is called out of darkness. It's separation from God in darkness. You're not going to go down there and set up a nightclub. No, you'll go out into eternity thirsting for God and you can never find him. You can never find the fulfillment that you missed in this life. What is your choice? A lot of people will say, well, I don't really want a change in my life. Well, the scripture teaches without that change that God demands, we'll never get to heaven. Like for me, I was a member of a church, but I hadn't really come to Christ. From the very beginning, I was reared in a Christian atmosphere. My father and mother both were Christians. By the time I was a teenager, there came an evangelist to our town, Mordecai Ham. I remember I got under such conviction. And one night, they gave the invitation to receive Christ, and I reluctantly went. But I really meant business with the Lord. I came just as I was, with all my sins, all my failures, and the Lord received me and changed me. That has transformed me till this day. I've never been the same. Jesus is the only way of life, eternal life, that he gives to every one of us that have put our faith in him. I became very depressed, and I couldn't get myself out of it. I tried going to a therapist. I tried 
meditation, I tried doing yoga, I tried all sorts of different things, but nothing was working. My last resort was to call my girlfriend, Sarah, and I called her up and I said, Sarah, can you tell me a little bit about your church? And that next Sunday, I'm sitting there and the pastor started preaching on exactly what, what I was dealing with in that moment. I started going to a woman's Bible study. I started pouring myself into it. I started reading scripture. And at one point, even though I, I still had some doubts, I was just like, what do I know to be true? Like deep down in my heart. And it was truly that Jesus is the Son of God. I gave my life to Christ and I said, yes, I do believe that Jesus is who He says He is. God was showing me step by step by step who I am and, and who God is. I started to see my own depravity. I started to see the depths of the sin within myself. And that is why Jesus had to die, because ultimately sin is, is what separates us from, from God, and Jesus had to come so that we can be forgiven. I had tried to, to forgive the man who murdered my dad. And then one day I was reading about Jesus dying on the cross. He was asking for God to forgive the people who were in the process of murdering him. And I understood in that moment that true forgiveness can only be done through God. I mean, it was so hard and so difficult, but I was able to forgive. Jesus has gone to prepare a home for us forever. It has given me such peace and the thought of heaven is just overpowering at times because it is a place where there will be no more fear, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. The Bible talks about heaven as a holy city, a perfect environment in which a perfect society dwells. Heaven will be a place in which its inhabitants will be freed from the fears and insecurities that plague and haunt us in the present life. And the scripture says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away, and we enter a new world. I'm looking forward to that glorious day of going to heaven. Are you ready? Are you ready? The scripture says that God's desire is that all men should be saved. He wants it so much that He gave His Son to die on the cross for you. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was a judgment. God judged Christ in your place. And Jesus, being who He was, had the capacity to endure hell for you. He did it for you because He loves you. Now God says you must repent of your sins and receive Him into your heart. Repentance is changing, changing your mind toward God and toward yourself, seeing yourself a sinner and seeing the holiness and the righteousness of God, looking at the cross of Christ and seeing that He died for you. And then the second thing you must do is to believe. That word believe means more than just believing with your mind. It means committing yourself, your total self to Christ as Savior and Lord. And then the third thing, you must be willing to follow Him and serve Him. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready? Yes, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice between some things that are wrong in your life and you have to make a choice with Christ. Which will it be? Everybody on duty that day expected a line of duty death. To have thought 
of your own casket. And it was real. Death was real. But here's a strange thing. There's something happened roughly 10 years earlier that connected that day and this day. It was a day back in 1995 and I was invited to a Bible study. There was a group of uh, eight to 10 of us, but at the end, the leader, he offered to those in the room listening to his voice if they wanted to receive Christ as their savior. There was a still small voice that told me, you need to do this. We all have a debt, the debt is sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it was that day, August 15th, 1995, is when I accepted the Lord into my heart as my Lord and Savior. And from that day forward, everything changed. In the middle of this raging inferno, I had peace. The peace that's rooted in my faith in Jesus Christ. And the scripture that is embedded in my heart is Romans 5.1. And said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And at this point, I had a conversation with God and said, God, I'm ready to come home. I woke up eight days later in the burn unit, unable to walk. Began my intensive recovery of over a year. It was tough, but I learned a lot. We all walk on a razor's edge, thin line between life and death. We're all gonna die one day. The question remains, are you ready? for that day. I found during the latter years of my life, when I've had sicknesses and been in the hospital and so forth, there's a peace that just resides there and stays there that I cannot explain. Everybody could have that same peace if they received Christ as their savior. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm looking forward to it with great anticipation because of what Jesus did on that cross. He died for us, but he was raised by God. And you'll notice that when the disciples went out after the cross and the resurrection. It says they went out preaching that Jesus was alive and that because he lives, we too are going to live someday in that same resurrection glory. We all die. I'm not going to escape it. I don't want to escape it. I want to go. The vast majority of my life has already been lived. My record has already been made. I don't have very much longer. I know that. Some of my closest friends and relatives, and especially my wife, are already in heaven. And because of the hope we have in Jesus, we can all be in heaven someday forever. But first, there must be a decision here and now in this life.
a radical change must take place before you can get into heaven, before you can be accepted by God. You say, well, what do I have to do? You must repent of sin. You repent and you believe. Believe in Christ and you receive him in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in and he'll come in. You don't have long. You'll be in eternity. And the decision you make tonight may decide where you'll be. Do you know Christ? Are you ready? Today, I'm asking you to put your trust in Christ. If you'd like to receive Christ, you can pray a prayer like this. You can pray a prayer like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for my sins. And rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent from my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. Never die.